Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 5 of Sprott Gold Talk Radio. I'm your host, Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Director at Sprott. Well, it's this time of year again when we are lucky enough to be joined by Ronnie Stoffler of Incrementum. Ronnie, thanks for joining Sprott Gold Talk Radio today. Thank you very much for having me, Ed. Always a pleasure talking to you. Well, you know, in the precious metals world, as nerdy as this may sound, I always look forward to this time of year because one of my favorite reports comes out, which is in Gold We Trust. And, and you guys do such a wonderful job to really help crystallize what's going on in the world today and, and probably even more importantly, what's you know, happened in the last 12 months relative to last year's report. Give us a little insight into not just your background, but really what makes your firm special. And frankly, how did In Gold We Trust even come to be? I, I started as an analyst at a big Austrian bank. And I don't know if, if it was a curse or a blessing, but I invested into a, a little small cap tuna explorer called Osisco Exploration back then. It turned out to be a 40 bagger. And I said, well, I don't have any clue about gold or the mining business, but this is pretty cool. 40 egg, that's nice. So I went to my boss and said, well, I would like to research the topic of gold. And back then I was analyzing Asian equities. And my boss said, well, you know, gold is always good. Go ahead and write a little special report. And yeah, that was basically the, the time when I started writing and researching the topic of gold. And I started publishing the In Gold We Trust report. Now in 2012, we received our first daughter. I quitted my job and I did set up Incrementum with partners from Switzerland, very senior guys, and also a close friend of mine, Mark Valek, who was a very successful uh, fund manager here in Austria. And I said, well, I would love to continue writing the In Gold We Trust report because there is a, a lack of solid, serious, not doom and gloom research in the gold space. And we really want to cater and to inform and educate institutional players, sophisticated investors, and just make a sober case for gold and not basically make the case for everything going to hell and for hyperinflation because there's already way too much this kind of gold research out there. Now we do publish the report in four languages in probably the most widely followed publication on the topic of gold. We published it on 24th of May and it's totally free of charge, which is also important for us. Thanks to our premium partners like Sprott, for example, who make it possible that we really make this available for everybody all over the globe, free of charge. This is the In Gold We Trust report, but primarily we are asset managers. We are a boutique asset management company based in Liechtenstein. We manage six investment funds. We manage private accounts for high net worth individuals. And obviously, we are very much focused in the commodities and precious metal space. Well, that's a, that's a, great, uh, that's a great download. And, and I, I tell you, I personally use your report throughout the year. It's sort of dog-eared, and I, I have a little black folder I carry around all my favorite stats in when I'm traveling and doing meetings. And, and this thing gets dog-eared and, and marked up all year long. Well, well, well Ronnie, we want to cover a lot of stuff, right? I mean, a lot's changed in the last 12 months, um, and a lot's kind of stayed the same. If you think about you know, where the S&P was this time last year versus today, as the Fed sort of puts pressure on balance sheets and starts to raise the cost of capital, we're certainly seeing some dislocations in the market from time to time. Yet gold's kind of marched along, right? It's continued to do its its role of, of being a store of value. Walk us through that a little bit. What do you think about gold over the last year? How happy or dissatisfied are you with its performance? And, and, and help our listeners kind of think about that going forward as we continue to see some of this, uh, this nagging volatility in the market. If we... Take a step back. Actually, gold has done nothing. It has stayed to be gold for the last 5,000 years. And as far as I know, it's still in our vault. An ounce is an ounce. The purchasing power of currencies has fluctuated quite wildly. But I think that gold has done its job very, very well as a solid defender in your portfolio. I think it's now really time to play defense. We are seeing lots of turbulence in many, many markets. And those crises always start in the periphery and then they move to the center. And, and we saw already last year that all those 
COVID meme stock, they started getting slaughtered. And now we are seeing Darling's uh, stocks like even Apple and Amazon and Tesla, all those tech stocks that did so well over the last couple of years, down between 20 and 60 percent. We are seeing enormous turbulence in bond markets. I think Jim Bianco said it's the worst start of the year for bond markets for the U.S. Treasuries for, I think, more than 100 years. We're seeing turbulence in many commodity markets, everything basically except for energy. If you have a look at lumber prices, if you have a look at copper, if you have a look at aluminium, we are seeing lots of turbulence, obviously also in crypto markets. So... Actually, the fact that gold in U.S. dollar terms has basically done nothing, it's even up slightly. I think this is a positive sign. Again, in euro terms, it's up 9%. I'm talking to private bankers over here in Europe. They are pretty nervous because they have to send out their quarterly statements to their client in a couple of days. And already the first quarter for so-called conservative balanced portfolios, they were down between 8 to 12%. Now the second quarter is even worse. So clients are down, let's say 30 up to 35, 40% in kind of conservative portfolios. And then of, on top of that, you've got inflation running at 8%. So there's an enormous amount of wealth destruction happening. And therefore, I think we, we shouldn't get too greedy. I think that gold did its job pretty well. I'm not super excited with the performance of gold, but I think given the turbulence that we're in, I think gold did quite okay. You know, we talked about this a little bit last year, and I think it's worth revisiting also. So often people talk about gold and the miners, gold and gold equities, uh, in the same sentence. Some some look at it as just simply to leverage trade, to the price of gold. Other look, uh, look at it is two separate allocations as we do at Sprott. You know, we look at the physical market in general, whether it's gold, silver, or other metals, is a low cost liquid way to hedge a portfolio, to balance a portfolio, maybe complement bonds and cash in a portfolio. But mining stocks are stocks, right? They're opportunistic allocations. It is true that as the price of the metals expands, the margins potentially expand in these companies as well. But how are you feeling or what are you seeing right now in the mining market? Because the large caps have actually held up quite well year to date. Small caps, not so much within the within the mining space, the seniors versus juniors. What are you seeing out there right now in the mining space uh, from an opportunistic standpoint or as an allocation standpoint? Well, I think you're totally right. We always differentiate between, you know, safety gold and on the other hand, performance gold. And, you know, if you want to hedge against worst case scenarios, against high inflation, against currency reforms, whatever, you have to think about your gold allocation and you have to minimize counterparty risk. I think this is really crucial. But on the other hand, if you say, well, you know, it's, it's kind of a nasty correction, but the world will continue to move on and we're close to the lows, then I think it, it also might makes sense to consider performance gold, which could be futures and options on, on gold on, or, or, or gold miners and obviously also the mining space itself. As you said, the large caps, they're doing pretty well. Of course, they have to deal with cost inflation, mostly energy, but also labor. But on the other hand, I'm seeing pristine balance sheets. I think that the companies did a good job over the last couple of years basically over the bear market to get their books in order to to deleverage to to decrease debt and to focus on creating shareholder value and creating free cash flow i think it is a little bit too early to call a bottom and the reason is i think from my point of view we are already in a recession the GDP now indicator for the first quarter was already negative. Now the second quarter is basically at zero when I looked at it last week. So it's already borderline official recession. I think at some point the Federal Reserve will realize, well, we went too far. We will have to make this U-turn or at least we have to hit the pause button for our rate hikes and for quantitative tightening. They are way behind the curve. Everybody knows that. I think this will be the point in time 
when gold, silver, and the mining stocks really start taking off. I think now it's it's a little bit like dinner is prepared, but nobody did really ring the bell yet and said, as they say in Italy, a tavola. So come to the table. We are having dinner now. I think this is a really, really nice setup. Now, coming back to the to the mining stocks, the moment they are really one of the very few value picks out there. Um, I'm seeing, you know, dividends between three to six percent for the large caps. I'm seeing an enormous amount of free cash flow. They are buying back shares. I see insider activity in many stocks. So I think it's a great setup for a long-term investor. For a speculator, perhaps it might be still a little bit early. I think the fact that we are seeing so much bearishness, despite the fact that gold is holding up so well, I think this is already kind of a, a positive sign again. We would obviously agree with that. You know, we've seen a lot of larger institutions start to show interest, whether it's through RFPs, DDQs, that kind of thing. We're starting to see that as well. The appetite continues to grow. You know, you mentioned something about the Fed and being behind the curve and, and maybe pay, potentially taking a pause, uh, specifically as we go here in the U.S., where we're, we're focused on the elections in November. And it'll be interesting to see kind of the game of chicken that gets played there. One of the things I think that keeps coming up is debt. Does it matter anymore? Do people care about it anymore? What does it look like in the balance sheets? And you have a great, in the abridged version, graph on page 15. that talks about central bank's balance sheets um, as a percent of GDP in 2007 versus 2021. And it almost looks made up um, when you look at the drastic <laughs> difference between what 2007 balance sheets looked like and what 2021 balance sheets look like. I've got to believe as we raise the cost of capital to try to combat inflation, we're just going to crush ourselves because the level of debt we have is just insane. When, is probably the best way to, to word it when you look at it. Now, the other side is, does that actually matter? And that that's the biggest question people are trying to figure out is how destructive is debt, particularly when the cost of, of servicing that debt's going up. How destructive is that to the, the, the economy? And what does that mean for gold? Well, actually, we wrote an entire book about that topic. It's called The Zero Rate Trap. And we published it in 2019. I think it's still a very, very good read. Ed. And, and, and we basically made the case saying that the higher the debt, the greater the sensitivity to rising rates. I think people tend to forget that we're coming out of a two-year COVID crisis, where basically it felt like, well, governments are taking care of everything. Dear taxpayer, you don't have to do anything. Just, you know, sit on your couch, order food and watch Netflix and we'll compensate for everything. But at some point, those bills have to be paid. And now after two years of an exceptional COVID crisis, we're moving into the next crisis. People tend to forget that, that the servicing costs for debt are now approaching levels that are just impossible to cover anymore. And I think it would be extremely naive, and you probably have to be a Fed economist to say, well, it doesn't have any impact. Obviously, it has a huge impact on consumption. And I can tell you over here in Europe, inflation is really the main topic. You're seeing it on the news. Only Mr. Putin, who is being blamed for high inflation rates, it's not the money printing, it's not the, the fiscal largesse, it's, it's only the Russians. Obviously, that was kind of the, the icing on the cake, but people tend to forget that inflation rates and energy prices were already rising significantly before Russia invaded Ukraine. And the problem with inflation is, if you talk to people from, from Turkey, for example, if you talk to people from emerging markets in general, I think it's the inflation psychology. Once we've got this inflationary mindset in our heads, as consumers, as business owners, as investors, it's really hard to go back to normal, moderate inflation environment. The next pockets that will become really nervous is real estate markets and other illiquid uh, investments, obviously like private equity. If you talk to private equity guys, they really fear big redemptions in a market when basically nobody is interested in, in, in buying risky stuff. I think, you know, we are already in a recession. It will become a really, really nasty recession. And at some point, 
central banks will have to reverse. And the big question is, can they do it without completely losing their face and, 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 and losing trust by financial markets? Yeah, I think those key, those two key words, trust and confidence, are everything, right? You're seeing the lack of trust in the markets. You're seeing the lack of believability in, their, in the Fed's ability to sort of turn this or soft land this. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. And, you know, once again, it, it looks like the, the gold side of the, of the allocation seems to uh, be doing its job, which is, which is really great to see. And the commodities in general, right? So, so often when people say, oh, well, I've, I've got my gold exposure, I have a commodity fund. Or when they talk about commodities, they lump gold in with that. But gold really has its own personality. You know, gold, I, I like to say, is really more of a monetary metal where all the other metals are more consumer metals or used or consumed. There are some things you can obviously use gold for outside of pure, you know, store of value or, or protection or diversification. But in general, it's really viewed as a monetary metal, even though it is, in fact, a commodity. Talk about that a little bit, because so often people think, well, commodities are commodities. I'm just going to own a basket and I'm going to get the benefit of that basket. But so often in a commodity fund, per se, gold is such a small piece of it. So I like to always say gold's the original alternative investment. But how would you how would you frame that? Is how should people invest or think about gold when they're looking at how can I protect my portfolio going forward? How can I continue to invest in the markets knowing I have to invest um, in, a, in a more safe, secure way um, and, and diversify? Or how do I stay invested? If I have a fixed pool of assets and I'm drawing it down uh, for income purposes in retirement, how do I stay invested? So talk a little bit about how you see gold relative to the other commodities in the world today. Well, that's a, a pretty complex uh question and and you know in in one of the funds that that mark and i manage we we've got a very active uh commodity exposure but i think it's it's really as you rightly say it's 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 important to differentiate between commodities and gold which i regard as a as a currency as money as you know as a competitor to to the US dollar to the Japanese yen to the euro whatever so i think the main reason for that is the so called stock to flow ratio gold has a tremendously high stock to flow ratio meaning that over the last let's say 5000 years we accumulated an enormous amount of gold more than 200000 tons and as the value of gold is not being created by destroying it, by burning it like it is with fossil fuels, for example, with oil, with net gas and so on. People tend to hoard gold and therefore gold has a very high stock to flow ratio while copper, for example, the warehouses are full for like four or five months, whatever. Uh, we're seeing it now in the energy space that there's very little reserves out there that even the national uh, reserves have to be tapped, that there's very little spare capacity. So obviously, if you have issues on the supply side, it has a much higher impact on a commodity with a low stock to flow ratio because there isn't just too much stock out there. So this is the main difference that I would regard. I think when it comes to making the case for commodities themselves, I, I think it's worth having a very close look at the 1970s, which were a tremendous, which were a stagflationary decade, which where, where I see many similarities and also some differences between now and the 1970s. But I think the many of the root causes of the 1970s stagflation obviously can be found in the 1960s. Like many of the root causes for the troubles that we are having can be found previously. When it comes to commodities, I think the main topic that many people forget basically saying, well, it's, it's only because, you know, of the political turbulences. I think people tend to forget that over the course of the bear market, we saw an enormous amount of underinvestment in the commodity space. So at the moment, we roughly, and this is based on a great GMO paper, we consume roughly 40% more commodities than 15 years ago. For example, net gas, iron ore, copper. And it's somewhat surprising that CapEx levels 
are at a 15-year low at the moment. So I think the capital intensity of commodity production has risen substantially recently. We're seeing it in the oil space. We're seeing it in the gold space. There isn't, I wouldn't call it peak oil or peak gold, but I would rather call it peak cheap gold and peak cheap oil. So it's just significantly more expensive to get it out of the ground. There's still en enough out there. And obviously, technology moves very, very fast. But when it comes to, to commodities, I think this, this underinvestment, this lack of capex is one of the main drivers. And it's just not so easy with now having higher demand saying, well, you know, let's, Uh, let's bring a copper mine online and, and start producing more copper. It's, there's huge time lags involved. And then on the other hand, I think we should not forget the ESG component. The Zero Banking Alliance, for example, it, it's kind of bringing together the big banks worldwide. It's, it's, it's representing roughly 40% of global banking assets. So all the big names, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Goldman, they're all in. And actually... They kind of sign a commitment to reinforce and to accelerate the implementation of decarbonization strategies. I talked to many of those bankers and for them, touching everything that has to do with commodities just doesn't feel so well because they've got a, a bad reputation for whatever reason when it comes to the whole ESG topic. The learning curve is steep and we're seeing that this kind of renewed kind of green demand in the commodity space is happening. We're seeing it in lithium. We're seeing it with cobalt, obviously. But I think when it comes to energy, but also when it comes to copper, when it comes to gold, I think we are seeing really the cost of capital rising significantly, which from my point of view will lead to higher commodity prices. And so, so I think those are two topics, lack of capex, but also ESG increasing the cost of capital. I think th those are two really important drivers that many market commentators tend to forget. And they are very, very long-term drivers. Just hearing you say that, it, it makes me think that, you know, one of the most established investments out there, gold, been around the longest, it is, you know, was in the on the brink of, of going out of out of favor when people weren't thinking about it a decade ago. And it's, it's probably more relevant today than it's been in decades, even in the face of cryptocurrencies. And I'd be remiss to not bring up cryptocurrencies just with the volatility we've seen in the last couple of weeks or months. For the longest time, so often people talked about cryptos is really modern gold or a replacement to gold. And what we're seeing, just from a pure volatility standpoint and a trading pattern standpoint, is probably one of the more opportunistic trades you can make out there. And it's really almost a polar opposite of what uh, gold represents and what gold's done in a portfolio. Talk just a little bit about, you know, how gold continues to do what it's done relative to either the perception or reality of cryptocurrencies in the market today. What, what, what's your view on that? Well, and I have to say that that regarding crypto or let's say Bitcoin in particular, we we are not that negative. And from my point of view, you know, we are we are pragmatic and opportunistic investors. So so I bought my first Bitcoins, I think, in, in 2012. I sold most of them way too early, as my wife reminds me quite often. <laughs> <laughs> But I did the same, by the way. So we're okay. <laughs> but but I think you know there's there's twenty thousand cryptocurrencies out there, and there's hundred and seventy fiat currencies out there. So I think it would be naive to think that all of them will will survive. And ninety nine point nine percent of all the cryptocurrencies out there are rubbish and won't probably survive this bear market. But when it comes to Bitcoin, I think it's from my point of view, it's it's quite binary. I think that it either will go significantly higher or it will, you know, in five years, my daughters will ask me, why, why did you buy this crazy Bitcoin thing? And why didn't you buy, I don't know, a nice apartment for us uh, in the mountains? <laughs> I think, you know, in the gold space, we should welcome competition. We are free market people. I think it's it's good to have competition in currency markets, as Hayek said. It makes the product being basically one of the most important things. Money, which is 
kind of a storage facility for life energy. I think monetary technologies have to be solid. Gold has made the case over the last 5,000 years that it's pretty good monetary technology. Bitcoin is around, uh, obviously, way for a way shorter time. We should, as gold guys, let's put it that way, I think we should be open to it and say, well, let's discuss money. And this is what I really love about the discussion going on, even though I have to say, Sometimes it, it really bugs me uh, on, on Twitter that there's the gold camp and the Bitcoin camp. Yeah. Uh, and I say, well, you know, we should we should kind of stick together and say, well, those are two opportunities and two ways to hedge against the monetary insanity that we are currently experiencing. So I don't think that gold is the enemy of Bitcoin and Bitcoin is the enemy of gold. I think, you know, they're kind of related parties. They're like cousins, but the real competitor probably is fiat currencies. And I just don't see a way that in two, five, ten years, the purchasing power of the euro, of the US dollar, etc., will rise significantly, especially measured in gold terms. I think you hit it right on the head, you know, for, for years, particularly when I started at Sprott, you know, over half a decade ago, it was gold versus Bitcoin. And you're absolutely right. And, and you can kind of throw out a lot of the other cryptocurrencies that are out there, right? They're just sort of chasing the chasing the car down the street, so to speak. But it seems like there has been a gradual shift of gold versus Bitcoin to gold and Bitcoin um, and viewing it as money, as currencies, as alternative ways to allocate away from the market. So we're actually even seeing it within some of the private families and so forth we work with. They're using gold to complement or hedge their crypto or risk on trades in general. And they, they clearly have them in separate buckets or, or pools of assets. So I really appreciate your insight on that because I think that's something that is continuing to evolve in a relatively short period of time, right? And I think those two roles and how they work together will continue to evolve uh, as we move forward. Well, Ronnie, we, we, we took a lot of your time. We really appreciate your your, 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 your words of wisdom. Um, I think there's a lot of great stuff in your report, in Gold Reef Trust report. Every year, as I mentioned, I carry it around with me, a lot of great charts. For our listeners out there that want to find this and download it and, and read it and, and use it and understand it, how do they do that? How can they find you? Well, it's it's fairly easy. We've got our webpage in gold we trust dot report, and there you can download totally free of, of of charge. As I've said, thanks to our premium partners, Sprout being one of them for many many years now, free of charge in German, in English, in Mandarin, in Spanish. There's the compact version, but there's also the triple X version for <laughs> for your vacation, roughly <laughs> 400 pages. We do have a monthly gold chart book that we also send out for free. We've got special chart books. We've got the In Gold We Trust Nuggets. Everything is available totally free of charge. You don't have to give us your email address or register for anything. You can just download it. And if you want to have a look at our products, our company is called Incrementum, incrementum.li, which stands for Liechtenstein. And I'm pretty active on Twitter. My handle is at Ron Stoefeller. Fantastic. Ronnie, well, it's always great to have you. Thanks again for your time. Uh, you're listening to Sprott Gold Talk Radio, and I'm your host, Ed Coyne. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best. You have been listening to the Gold Talk podcast by Sprott Inc., for more information and insights on precious metals investing, please visit Sprott.com. This podcast should not be copied, distributed, published, or reproduced whole or in part. The information contained in this podcast does not constitute research or recommendation from any Sprott entity to the listener. Neither Sprott nor any of its affiliates make any representation or warranty as to the accuracy or completeness of the statements or any information contained in this podcast. And any liability, therefore, including in respect of direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage is expressly disclaimed. The views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of Sprott, and Sprott is not providing any financial, economic, legal, accounting, or tax advice or recommendations in this podcast. In addition, the receipt of this podcast by any listener is not to be taken as constituting the giving of investment advice by Sprott to that listener, nor to constitute such person a client of any Sprott entity. 
past performance is no indication of future results.